NASA ran this workshop. Moon to Mars is a big program for NASA. Obviously, it includes Artemis and it includes getting all the way to Mars. They had run a survey. They asked people to contribute to their objectives. So they published a list of their objectives, which is quite lengthy. They listed that. And then among the people that answered for the ones that they thought were interesting enough, they invited them to come. And so in particular, a guy from National Space Society, John Strickland, was allowed to come and bring a team of four. I happen to be one of those. David Chevron is another one who some of you here know. He attends this chapter meeting. He's on the uh, remote right now. So he can correct me when I say incorrect things here. So based on those objectives, a meeting was called. And the idea was various organizations make a presentation in a 30-minute meeting after some general introduction by NASA. This may have been the first meeting of the type. I mean, NASA hasn't really, that I know of, just gone out and said, hey, folks, what do you want us to do? Usually it's been kind of much more top down than that. So this was an interesting thing. Let's see how it would work out. The attendees are made up of companies, universities, and other nonprofits. And the companies reflect pretty much all the traditional aerospace companies, plus the newer ones like SpaceX, Blue Origin, virtually everybody, a variety of universities. Nonprofits included National Space Society and some others as well. For NSS, who went? Well, it was a kind of a cross-section of people. Most of us were from Texas, however, simply because it was here. So it was close. So we had presidents of the chapters of North Texas, South Texas. I went Austin as well. So we were there presenting basically our view of what we should be doing. So it started off, they gave the introduction, and I'm going to show you some of their slides later, but let's talk about what led to this, and that was what the objectives were. There's no way we're going to go through all those in this meeting. It's way take way too long, but they broke them out into some major categories. One was transportation and habitation, which a lot of people thought was kind of odd to throw those two together, except if you think about it from the NASA perspective, an awful lot of habitation is occurring on spacecraft. So, you know, that's transportation. So they put them together. And you can predict what a lot of these kind of goals would be. Build a system that a crew can routinely operate to a lunar orbit and the surface and those kind of things. So there's a lot of things there you might expect. We'll talk more about the details, but at a high level, you might say a lot of these things would pretty much be expected. There were a few oddball ones in there. The last one, they said they wanted to be able to return large cargo mass from Mars. And we all kind of scratched our heads at that. It's like, okay, maybe, you know, sometime in a distant future, but is that really something worth worrying about now? I think really what they were going for was they're trying to justify the Mars sample return mission to get those things that are being collected by Perseverance now. And somehow or other, they wanted to get the science goal in there, and then they lumped it in with large cargo. So who knows? We pointed that out. and I think there was some kind of confusion on the wording on their part. Exactly. So Doug is saying, yeah, it's the same view we took, that what's likely to come back from Mars is basically samples. And yeah, yeah, maybe 15 pounds, you know, maybe 50 if you, uh, you know, throw in a little extra rocks we're not thinking about yet. But certainly nothing that we would call large. I mean, large means units of tons. <laughs> we're, we're talking about delivering maybe 100 tons to Moon or Mars at some point. That's large. They didn't really mean that. So the next category was uh, lunar and Martian infrastructure objectives. And again, you'd kind of expect you got to have navigation, you got to have communication satellites, those kind of things. Next category was operations objectives. Things like if you have a lunar space station, you got to run it. A lot of things were in the category of demonstrate this and demonstrate that, which was kind of a weakness, we thought. And we'll talk more about that later. And then there are science objectives. Typically, you know, things like conduct field geology, bring back samples, and so on. We did think there was an unusually large emphasis on returning samples. This is probably my view in particular, but in general, we were saying, if you're going to spend three or $4 billion on a mission to go to a place like Mars, or even the moon, Artemis costs $4.1 billion, if you're going to do that, why don't you spend a billion on just making better analytical instruments that can just analyze it there and, and don't waste time sending all these samples back? There's probably a few you really want, but do you really need to bring back everything? Well, and Especially they said large samples. Yeah, that's right. People were saying they wanted large samples coming back. We don't really know why. And then there were additional science objectives related to biology and so on. And we'll get into more detail. But in general, they tended to have a lot of things that said, understand this and understand that. They didn't say actually use any of that information for anything. Okay, so Doug's point was that their definition of large is probably just a lot different than we were thinking. When we think large, we're thinking in industrial size. They're thinking something bigger than the two grams of lunar regolith that they gave to the University of Florida for doing their growth experiments. So Doug's point is that we've had to wait 50 years to do a lot of the analysis, even on the moon rocks, and we don't want to you know, have the same kind of weight for Mars. And that's certainly true. And we didn't mean to imply that we're against all samples. It's just that it turned out when you're looking at these objectives, they were just everywhere. And there was no goal to make better analytical instruments to also do some of the tests on Mars. I think in all cases, there's always going to be things like, yeah, we want to bring some back so we get a good look at it. 
think of things that we didn't think of 50 years ago. So, you know, of course, there's always going to be that. Now, the next question, how do these goals of NASA match up with what NSS thinks is a good idea? Hopefully reflecting what most of you would think is a good idea. To review what those are, the goal from the webpage of the National Space Society is defending Earth from dangerous asteroids while enabling the development of the vast resources of space to benefit everyone. And there's four sub-goals of that. Defending Earth from asteroids and so on. Clean energy from space, perhaps space-based solar power. And then developing space, meaning get a presence out there, and communities in space, meaning actually living there. So how much does that really match up with what NASA wants to do? It turns out, not so much. Well, I'll get into details on that, but how do we reconcile this? Well, one thing we did say is that the Space Society really can't expect NASA to develop the whole space economy and build the settlements itself, but what they should be doing is enabling industry to do so. One of the complaints that we had was it didn't show up in the objectives. It didn't appear to be much of a NASA objective to actually make this happen. And a side note on that is that we really want to enable commercial capabilities. NASA should be encouraging it as much as possible. And the end result being you get more science done, even, as well as doing everything at lower cost and with less time. We addressed this in several ways. One was pointing out objectives that were just flat out missing and then modifying some of the others. And the second area was in business practices. How do they do business with the, the commercial sector? NASA has had some successes in this that we want to encourage. When they set up the commercial cargo plans and commercial crew for supplying the space station with cargo and then with people, that was essentially buying a service. They were literally buying seats and they didn't worry as much about exactly how they got there. Now, they obviously did, in fact, provide technical guidance and help to the private companies doing it, but it changed the nature of the game. It allowed companies to develop knowing they had a market because they had a guaranteed number of seats they had to fill, but then they could sell them to other people in the future. And that's different than just going out and buying spacecraft, which is pretty much what NASA was doing before. Other areas that we think NASA was making good progress in, CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. There's a lot of the robotic probes that are in progress right now for going up and doing some of the surveying and, the, and the analysis, looking at for lunar water and that sort of thing. They're being enabled that way. They're being bought as a service. A rover will deliver something to NASA. They're doing that more. The human landing system, which is the big part of getting the crew and cargo down to the moon, was done. They call it HLS, the human landing system. That's being done with Starship, and that's being done that way as well. And most recently, last month, we talked about the commercial spacesuits, where NASA had been lagging. They weren't really going to have spacesuits ready for the Artemis lunar program. And actually, they also had a problem with having spacesuits still working on the space station. So they engaged two private companies to rent them spacesuits. So they're doing a lot of things what we think is probably the right way, partially because the commercial sector is more sensitive to cost, partially because it brings in additional investment. So NASA gets more for its money. It doesn't have to buy and build absolutely everything. It can buy services and let other people, investors, take the risk and basically enlarge the market. So what were some of the concerns that we had in this meeting? I think at the highest level, what's the end goal? What are they trying to accomplish? We found out that we didn't really realize it quite as heavily until now, and that's that their end goal is a Flags and Footprints mission to Mars. So what is that? Well, that says you go, you make a short visit, you plant some flags, you walk around and make some footprints, and you leave. We did a lot of that with Apollo. Now, we went further. We did bring back a lot of samples, but there's still a strong element of that, and it sounds like we're kind of repeating that both on the moon and on Mars. We think the goal should be stated more clearly as sustainable bases on the surface of lunar Mars. What's happened instead is that because the end goal is pretty much just that first human mission to Mars, which would be a short one, they're kind of locking into expensive and mature technologies for short missions rather than really an economically sustainable technology. Let me give you an example. And this actually comes from David Chevron, who worked at NASA. He attended classes and they, they did some exercises in some of these classes where they talked about what technologies are needed for three different scenarios. One is where you do a short mission to some planet like, say, Mars. Another one is where you do kind of an intermediate, you know, a year or two, some period in between. And then case three would be, okay, what if you just go to stay? And the question was, what technologies do you develop to make that happen? And the answers were quite different. There was some commonality, but for instance, if you're going to stay a long time, you worry a lot about living off the land, or as they say, in situ resource utilization. You worry about getting out water from the regolith or from, you know, ice deposits, you find them. You worry about taking that water and through hydrolysis, generating air, and then with chemical reactions, generating propellant. But you don't worry about that if you're only going for a week. 
but you just take everything with you. You don't worry about the food. You just bring it with you, you know, and you eat it up. You throw away your plastic packaging on the surface. If you're going for a long time, though, you've got to grow food, you know, and you need the air and everything. You can't bring enough with you on a long mission. So it really matters what your end goal. If your end goal is really just short term, you don't worry about the things you really need to have a sustained presence in space long term. So, for example, nowhere was it stated in the NASA objectives anything related to having propellant depots, where the idea would be to really lower costs to go to Mars, you really ought to be going to the moon first, which we are doing, but then generating fuel there and sending it up to a fuel depot and loading up the rocket that's going to Mars there, rather than bringing all that fuel from Earth, which is much more expensive. Now, there's obviously some technology risk there. But long term, you pretty much know that's the way to go. Even as the access cost for space gets better, it's still going to be expensive to get off of Earth as opposed to getting off the moon. There was really no mention in the objectives of recycling, agriculture, artificial gravity. Can people even really live on the surface of the moon for long, long periods of time or Mars? Is the gravity enough? We don't really know. Or for that matter, what if you're just making a nine month mission to get to Mars? Maybe we should be looking into artificial gravity, meaning rotating. Uh, rotating the craft. That's really not in their plans. And of course, a big one is cost. There aren't really any objectives to try to lower the costs. And the way you lower them, one way is reusing vehicles and increasing the flight frequency. That's just not part of it. So the net result, I pulled this picture on the right here off of one of the NASA slides. Here's what's coming up even before the delays. They're saying, we're going to send some missions to the surface of the moon. You probably thought those are going to be for a long time. No. From 2025 through 2031, you're talking about sending two people, maybe six and a half to 14 days. And that's for years. Now, after 2031, then maybe we'll send four people up there and maybe they'll stay 30 days. This is not a sustainable lunar presence. You don't have to worry about even having a habitat that shields people from radiation significantly. Like you don't pile up a lot of regolith on top of it, just to be sure. There's a lot of things like that you just don't bother doing if you're only planning on being there for six to 14 days or even 30 days. So it changes the nature of what's being done. Yeah, so Doug's comment is it looks like Apollo 2, and that's exactly right. And that's what we mean by mature technology. So SLS, the rocket, of course, is involved in that. That's basically an extension of space shuttle technology. They're literally reusing the engines from the space shuttle until they use them up. They're going to use them in an expendable mode. It's kind of funny. This whole thing was held down at the Houston Space Center because it's right next to NASA. It's just convenient. We don't have to get fancy badges and things. So they have kind of a museum aspect to the Houston Space Center. And they have one of those RS-25 rocket engines there. That's what the space shuttle used. It's a museum piece. And that's what we're using. Now, it is actually a good engine. They make that point. There's a plaque. They say it's the best engine possible. Okay, obviously, that can't be true because technology will improve. But the point is, we are still reusing things that we developed many, many years ago. Okay, continuing on the concerns. At a high level, what is NASA's purpose? It came through loud and clear in their talks that they think their purpose is doing science. And they mean science in a very abstract sense, mostly pure science. For instance, they're going to pay a lot of attention to the 10-year decadal studies and the last one said we should go and study Mars in great detail, and that worked out pretty well. The next one says we ought to go to Neptune. There's probably a lot of good science there, but we're probably not going to be developing settlements or commercial business or any kind of economy on Neptune for a long, long time. There's a very different result if you just emphasize pure science as opposed to emphasizing science that will help space development. So for instance, the kind of science that would help space development would be things like figuring out how to grow stuff. What do you need to do to get lunar regolith or Mars regolith? Turn that into something useful, more like soil. Maybe you need chemical treatment. Maybe you need all different kinds of things to make it more useful. They're not doing that much of that. Now, there is some of that research going on. It's being done on a small scale by other organizations. But the point is that the people that are doing the big missions aren't assuming that any of that will ever work. And that's where there's kind of a breakdown there. There's a lot of good research on NASA, but it's not being used and assumed necessary because of the short-term focus. Another issue was that NASA isn't really engaging with the commercial space companies. And this kind of means new space companies. They're not getting early enough input. The process is decide what needs to be done, and then contract it out to industry. So there is interaction with industry, but industry didn't get to contribute right up in the beginning saying, if we do this other thing, we could do it cheaper. Or maybe you should be thinking about this. There's not as much of that going on as there should be. And as I said before, there's a lot of emphasis on sample return missions as opposed to simply doing better analytical techniques. Also, in the entire conference, there was no mention of China, not once. 
there's no sense of urgency. For instance, staking out squatters' rights. Governments can't own land, according to the Outer Space Treaty, on places like the Moon and Mars, but they can occupy space. And once they're there, they can tell people not to bother. So there's obviously going to be kind of a rush to get there and stake out strategic locations. And those are things like the Earth Moon L1 point, Lagrange point, where you probably put a fuel depot, and certainly the lunar poles, which have water and easy access to almost around the clock solar power. So, yeah, so Doug's comment is that the Chinese have stated in print that they want to put up a lunar base. We kind of need to get going because they might just kind of spread out and make it very, very difficult to do the same thing. So, Bill Nelson is raising the flag now that maybe we better think about China but it hasn't gotten reflected yet in any of the goals. And you don't really get a sense of of urgency. That's one thing about emphasizing pure science. It's a good thing. We've gotten a lot of good things out of that, but that doesn't demand that things be done on a schedule because there's other things that may be going on. Okay, so this is a slide they put up, which looks kind of innocuous, describing what NASA does. So the idea is on the right-hand side of this slide, you pick your end goal. Then once you pick your end goal, you probably think of sub goals and and you start thinking about what are all the pieces you need to put together to make the whole program work, say getting to Mars. On the left-hand side are the individual pieces that have to be built. There's landers and rovers and all these things, and they get defined and then they get built gradually, kind of moving left to right at time. But it starts at the top with a high-level goal. And as I said, what was a little bit disturbing that we really realized at this meeting was The top level goal for NASA, for the Moon to Mars program anyway, is a short mission to Mars. And that's it. The problem is everything else gets reflected in that. If you only have a short mission to Mars, you don't really need to spend a lot of time on the moon to get experience living for a long time off Earth. You don't really need to worry about all those issues of in-situ research or utilization and all these other things that really we know are going to be needed to make real progress in the universe. And it comes out in this next slide that they showed as well. This is their Moon to Mars exploration strategy. It tells you right up on the top, operations on the moon will help prepare for the first human mission to Mars. That first human mission, that is the end goal. That is the end of the moon to Mars program. Now, maybe they'll change that. We certainly gave them feedback that we thought a sustainable Mars presence and a sustainable lunar presence was actually a much more important goal. But currently, everything they've done is pretty much to get people on the Mars for a short period of time. It shows up in some of the details on the slide if you look more closely. For instance, in situ research utilization, they show that on the moon and on Mars as a very small wheeled vehicle. They're not showing mining. They're not showing any kind of factory to produce air or any of that kind of thing or water or fuel for the next missions. It's a demonstration and a test, which is still a good thing to do. But the point is they're not going far enough. In their goals, they say demonstrate. And that's really all it is. They're not actually planning on using this stuff even to get to Mars, even though it would help their costs quite a bit. Greg, you might want to mention who's in the pictures presenting, who we were talking with there or who was speaking there too. Okay, that's a good point. So on the right hand side, this is Pam Pam Melroy, former astronaut and yeah. associate uh, administrator. Yeah, she was the top level person there. Number two Um, in charge of NASA. Then there's Kurt Bogle, who goes by the nickname of Spuds, and he never explained why he goes by that nickname. And then the guy who's speaking here is named Jim Free. These represent pretty high level management in NASA. Yeah, Um, Yeah, Jim Jim Free's the head of the exploration uh, mission directorate at NASA. Now this Spuds Vogel, he was kind of interesting because he came from DARPA. So I think there's a good thing there that he's probably going to bring in some new thinking to NASA. That also got him in trouble on the slides because in all their goals, they kept saying develop this and that. And most people in the space community took that to mean traditional NASA builds or contracts to buy stuff as opposed to NASA works with others to get something done. And he's saying, Well, I worked in DARPA and DARPA doesn't develop anything, but they use the word develop. And so there may have been some confusion about that. I think a lot of people were rather worried that the whole goal structure that was set up by NASA was oriented toward them doing everything. Well, they actually put that in the glossary too, that develop means NASA does it and demonstrate means NASA does it and industry can follow. Yeah. That, in fact, was one of the big objections that we had. And in fact, I think a lot of the other, certainly the more the new space people and some of the academic people also. Uh, Some other things I'll point out about this human landing system. Now, this is probably just an old slide, but, you know, the human landing system is shown here as a a little tiny thing. Well, for the moon anyway, that's going to be Starship. That would be off this chart. I mean, it would be so much bigger than everything else here. It's not even funny. And that has not really truly been reflected in their thinking yet. For instance, they're still talking about bringing down all these small amounts of stuff. They have the ability with Starship to bring down huge amounts of stuff. But right now, the bottleneck would be getting it. 
because they want to go through the Lunar Gateway, you'd have to get it there on SLS. So that's not going to happen. But anyway, it just points out that they haven't really even fully thought through everything they're, they're doing yet. Okay, the surface habitat, if you look at it kind of in the back left-hand side for the moon, it's just this little thing that obviously was another lander. That's not a serious long-term habitat. A serious long-term habitat probably would be buried under regolith, but it certainly would be bigger than that, probably more situated in the ground. This is clearly just something that they're dropping in place. And they're doing the same thing on Mars. You know, again, they're not really talking about building a serious new thing. They're just talking about dropping something down. And it really shows up in these slides. So we don't know what the thing in the orbit around Mars is. Oh, yeah. They, they know how we're getting to the moon uh, in the current plans, and that's via the gateway. This, this other stuff, they didn't talk about at all, stuff that's hanging over Mars here. But there's some ship that gets to Mars, and then there's some kind of a lander that comes down and goes back up. Presumably deep space hab of some kind, but uh, yeah, yeah, they really talked about it. Very limited scope. Okay, so Doug's question was basically a comment that probably NASA knows more about what budgets are going to allow, and there's no doubt about that. They're trying to live within a budget. The thing is, if we think if they did things smarter, they could accomplish a lot more. Now, Craig, you might mention, you know, the fact that there's so many things that have been omitted could end up representing an opportunity for private sector contributions commercial space opportunities like for a hab or for things like that. Well, the classic summary of, of that point is no bucks, no buck Rogers. Yeah, we think we're trying to help out NASA here. NASA needs help. And the way they're going to help them is get more early involvement from a lot of these uh, companies that will invest their own money once they're convinced that NASA will buy the services from them. And it's just a matter of setting up that structure. It will be possible to bring in a lot more people. Ultimately, NASA, they're kind of the big person on the block here. You think of them as the, the anchor tenant in a shopping mall, if you will. But their tradition has been, they're just it. They're the entire shopping center. And, and they're kind of moving toward this model of, well, okay, there's a lot more boutique shops coming in, you know, with Clips and, and all these other programs that are being done. We need a lot more of that. And we will get, you know, a bigger mall as a result. And they need that kind of help. Yeah. Craig, I don't know if you heard, but I was, I was commenting that uh, the omission of things like having anything in there for uh, ISRU plants, production scale, or large habitats, larger habitats, or anything like that could be an opportunity for industry to uh, yeah. get in, get involved for private sector, for um, you know, commercial space under things like uh, le leasing facilities to NASA or so forth, buying yeah. propellant. The, with the CLIPS program I was talking about for the moon, there are some in-situ research experiments being done there, I think, as part of that. Our objection has been that in no way does NASA planning account for using any of the results of this. In other words, they assume it's going to be done, but they're not going to do it themselves. And that's, that's really what's missing in all this. And that's why they're looking at the moon as a stepping stone to Mars. And then presumably the next time, well, the Mars will be a stepping stone somewhere else. But the objection is from a lot of people that, you know, you want to leave behind something in each one of these places that you can keep going back to. You want to maintain those stepping stones. And right now, they're just kind of being almost abandoned in the current plans. So I just wanted to say that this is the exploration mission, that an exploration mission through the NASA strategy is considered for two to max three astronauts that are going to stay seven days or 14 days, and in the worst case scenario, 28 days. That is the reason you're not seeing larger habitats or you're not seeing more rovers or these are the bare minimum requirement just to touch the surface of the moon or Mars and that's it. The next strategy after the exploration is, uh, is called the um, science mission strategy, which is considered the staying uh, about six months to maximum one year. That includes six astronauts to eight astronauts. And then we have the larger, uh, for example, habitat. It is still not going to be under the ground. Everything is going to be uh, on the surface and they're basically exploring everywhere to make sure that, for example, they find enough water so that they can uh, have that um, pinpoint on the surface that they uh, start doing the ISRU 3D printing and stuff like that. After okay. that, then there's going to be the settlement mission that is going to be something between three years to 10 years that, it, that is going to be 
some have fully autonomous that 3d printers all the machinery robots are going to start building stuff before even the human arrives there or even growing stuff because probably we're not going to have for example greenhouse or food uh, production modules even at that time and after that three or ten years of the mission when the infrastructure are established on the surface when they have built uh, landing pads uh, roads or stuff like that then it's going to have uh, they're going to have launch larger size habitats, the greenhouses and stuff like that. So well, this do, you, do you have any place that you can refer to where that is documented? Because I mean, these were the, these were the top NASA officials and they didn't mention any of that. They seem to have no plan. idea about it. Was that official or is that a, is that, you know, hope? These are NASA roadmaps 2019, I guess. Oh. Oh uh, I'll yeah, find yeah. The PDF file and send it to you if you want. Yeah, but that's all changed. That they're they're changing because of congressional pushback in about 2018 and 2019. They've changed to this moon to Mars strategy. That was a lot of good talk they had back then, but there aren't actually any plans to do any of that. This is, I mean, this is it. A lot of people believe in that, and that's a good thing. You know, they fund a lot of separate research, like through NIAC and all these other things, that will help in that regard. But the actual projects that would actually get you there, they're not doing any of that. There is no strategy for the next step. NASA kind of views its goal as science first, well, science and exploration. You could say it's kind of those two things. This is just saying this is the exploration strategy, and exploration is really just there to support science anyway. That is all there is. I'll show you a slide from their 2019. They still have this slide up on NASA. They want to say, we're going forward to the moon to stay. It turns out it's really just a visit occasionally for short periods. They specifically said, we will use the resources of the moon to enable further exploration, but it's not actually true. Actually, they're gonna do some experiments. There are no plans to do, to do anything beyond that. Anything that's gonna be done on the moon or Mars is strictly gonna be imported from Earth, period. I understand what you're saying. You're saying, this is just the exploration strategy. I'm saying, that's all there is. Other than small efforts, which are being done, which will contribute. And then they set it aside and this is their program. Last year, we worked with ICON and for the Moon to Mars Olympus project, and which is basically the next phase of the exploration strategy. And we did the science mission and we, give, uh, we gave them the report that what exactly is the requirement. We even introduced the whole landing pad idea, the infrastructure idea and everything. So, but what we had as blueprints that we started the whole project at the very beginning, was that roadmap that I mentioned you. So probably they're not introducing it because they have not finalized it yet. I mean, honestly, we had a meetings in a couple of weeks ago and I don't think they have the budget for that. So that is the reason. Well, I, ICON was present and I spoke to the representative from ICON and he had the same concerns we had. We started working with ICON, there were four um, yeah, I, I con presented to the NASA Commercial Space Telecon when it was just started. Yeah, we're we're familiar with um Jason and and all. That was a good discussion. I mean, I think uh, sorry, it's just all yeah. Weird. I mean, it it points out the disconnect between different organizations at NASA, different things NASA is trying to get done, and what Congress will allow to be done, or what Congress wants to be allowed and how NASA is responding to pressure from Congress and, you know, how this results in a disconnect between all these things. I've been on an economic research for space development grant with Brad Blair and Hannah Renz and Hoyt Davidson, where it was all about research for space development, economics of space development. And NASA there didn't even know what the term space development meant. Yes, but I'm saying that Jason is a biologist who had no idea about space mission. And when they started with us, they were just four non-space, not engineer people. We and other company, we gave them everything and we developed everything. We wrote that report. So yeah. <laughs> well, well, we've written reports on evolvable lunar architecture and public-private partnerships with space commercial doing this, and yet nothing happens. So, you know, that, that's the problem that we've got here is there's a lot of different things happening in different parts of NASA, but what actually gets done is not necessarily going to incorporate all that. 
I, I think that's a good point, David. I mean, NASA is a huge organization and there are definitely people in NASA who are, are visionaries and see settlements and things, uh, resources being mines and depots and stuff. But even though there's people with that, they're not necessarily, that's not a, the actual official funded, executed plan that's being done, which is uh, quite a bit smaller than that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, the people that we met with included the deputy or the acting senior architect for ESMD was there, Michelle. Jerry Sanders, the lead for ISRU was there. I've worked with Jerry for years. Uh, Michelle was in my group 20 years ago, almost when we were doing this kind of work. And ISRU keeps getting a little bit of funding trickled in to kind of keep people researching, but it never gets the funding to actually get utilized. That's, uh, that's a point. Dave Huntsman, who was uh, working with us, the partnership lead for Glenn Research Center was working with us. That's the problem. We just keep getting all these different things that NASA knows needs to be done, but it, it just keeps getting moved out of the programs or not getting funded substantially. And NASA's not really sure how to incorporate the private sector to do what, what they could do or help enable getting the risk buy down so that companies like ICON can get funded to do this kind of stuff. That's the problem we've got. And like I say, I mean, we had the deputy administrator for ESMD was chairing our meeting. I mean, these are senior level people and these are the ones that know what's able to actually get put in the programs or not. Okay, I'll skip over this next slide here, but this just lays out what all the various Artemis steps actually are. We'll make these slides available. You can look at them in detail if you want later on. So conclusions on objectives. What we've been trying to stress is that sustainability is ultimately what matters, and that means economic sustainability. Things have got to be cost-effective, and that's got to be upfront and driving decision-making, and it's just not right now. That includes things like improving the reusability of all the elements, making a goal out of that. With that, you get increased flight rates with reusable equipment. That will be sustainable. In situ resource utilization sooner, not later. Right now, it's tacked in at the end of everything saying, oh, we're going to do a little bit of demonstration you know, work. And that's a good thing, but it should be done up front so that we can actually start to use it as soon as possible, as opposed to being kind of a side program. Really, you need R&D more front-end loaded, getting the industry involved earlier. The words tipping points come in there, that once everybody believes there's enough of a market for something, you'll get all kinds of people piling in with public-private partnerships and so on. And so in general, make more use of the commercial space industry involving them more early. And that, those are really the keys. So what happens if they don't do that at the rate we're going? We're going to the moon not to stay, as they said in 2019 in that nice roadmap, but we're really just going to visit occasionally for short periods. We are going quickly and sustainably, according to this. It turns out it's not so quick and it's not sustainable. It's really still expensive, short missions. We are, we meaning NASA here, they are actually using some new approaches. They've been making progress. They're going to get a lot more done on the moon. It's sort of the side programs, you know, not, not the big ones with the human landings, but with the robotic programs. But we're really failing on using the resources of the moon. It was a goal in 2019. And they've definitely pulled back from that. Now they're just talking about demonstrating a little bit. But even in Mars, they'll just import everything they need from Earth, and that's it. So we will try to prove out technologies. That is still a goal, but it's going to be expensive. That actually does risk losing the programs. If Congress decides they don't want to fund things that much, we, we are at risk, I think. So that wraps up the talk on the objectives. David, did you want to comment any more? You know, this is, this is to the point about how these things keep getting postponed, delayed, you know, carpet pulled out from under them, uh, and, and why we've got to be active in trying to keep these things actually happening. And that's a, a function of the policy committee at NSS. So, uh, you know, and we've got the Alliance for Space Development, but we've got to keep active uh, trying to get these things you know, actually uh, done. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I just want to share this one slide. It's, you know, we've, we've got about 20 some slides that we presented. While we're waiting for that, those questions about any new information about a fission power source. Um, no, they've said they're developing. I think there is a program to develop. Yeah, it. they showed it as an element in one of their uh, 
their figures. The workshop was only about objectives, not how to, uh, how to achieve any of those. I just want to point out one of the things is that say, after years and decades of knowing ISRU or living off the land would fundamentally change the game, and that includes doing things like ICON wants to do, what, Masha, what you want to do with the resources that are there, NASA continuously deprioritizes these things until years and years after start of the lunar surface, and then they wonder why it costs so much. I don't know if you happen to know Brad Blair, but he started uh, on the first push seniors space exploration initiative sei program brad specialized in how to do isru even back then he worked with doug cook who later became the nasa associate administrator for exploration who i also used to work with uh, I, I was in doug's group um, but brad passed away the weekend that we were trying to put this together he had he had actually uh, planned to go through our comments on ISRU and Brad, uh, Jerry Sanders, who is NASA's chief person for uh, ISRU, knew Brad, known him for many of these years. And I mean, it's, it's, I mean, he just, you know, it, it struck a, a spot with him. It's like, you know, Brad's like the third expert in ISRU to pass, pass away while we've been waiting for NASA to, you know, make, get serious about ISRU. You know, we had Peter Spudis, uh, we had uh, Bernard Cutter from ULA, and now Brad. They're, you know, it's just a string of everybody that's been trying to do this for 30 years is not going to be with us anymore. That's all. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Well, I think, uh, you know, it's sort of like a chicken and egg situation. Um, you know, NASA uh, needs to do inspirational, transformative things to get people excited. But in order for them to do that, people need to be excited about them <laughs> doing it. So it's, it's like, how, how do you actually get that, that positive circle working? And I think part of it, at least the beginning of it, at least formulating kind of a concept of what it would be among people like us and kind of spreading that vision to a wider audience that we could have an exciting future in space. And um, NASA has an important role to play there, um, but to really make it happen, we gotta get lots of people involved. Oh, hey, Barbara, I noticed you had your hand up. Hi, um, you know, uh, nobody will like this, but uh, I'm, I'm gonna take the contrarian view. Um, and that is, um, you know, uh, if you haven't seen the cartoons about the joy rides in space, you should take them very seriously. So we have people with billions in the private sector that could be doing this, right? And they have elected instead to put a Tesla. And, you know, it's going to be hard for me to argue as, as uh, the economic situation gets worse and worse for average people, that we should put tax dollars into it uh, so that the billionaires can then uh, go off and, and have lower risk. And yet they're telling us that they're the people that are taking the risks. And so we've got some sort of fundamental problem there, I think, in the way we, we are thinking about this. I, I work in uh, the energy industry and I see it now with, uh, with hydrogen technologies, right? Oh, well, they're, they're, they're perfect. We could do them instantly, uh, but we would get the same subsidies as uh, electric and uh, as um, coal and wind, as wind and, uh, wind and solar, or we won't do it, right? And, and so, you know, that we've got this business sense that we all should line up at the trough as business people. And we don't, and you know, we keep saying we want thousand percent returns because we're taking risks. But guess what? We really want NASA to take the risk. We really want DOE to take the risk. We really, which means that the uh, middle-class taxpayers take the risk. And I don't think we're gonna be able to sell that. So uh, I want you to think about how you would sell this with guess what? private industry, you're going to have to put your big boy pants on now and, and start taking some of the risk yourself and not 
pushing it all up on the taxpayers. I, th I think in reality, the industry has taken a lot of risk. Uh, I, I've, I've known people who have uh, taken those risks too. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's, there needs to be a shared risk model. I mean, there's, there's the cost plus model where the government takes all the risk. There's the fixed price contract model where the private industry takes a lot of the risk. Uh, there may be some places where there needs to be more emphasis on kind of a blend between those where, you know, cost plus is good where there's, there's absolutely, you know, no real experience in doing something like you've done before. So you can't, you can't really cost it properly because you've never done it. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, I think there's a, a room for that. And that's, that's part of one of the things when you look at public private partnerships that we need to do. And actually putting a Tesla on that test flight, which was uh, otherwise just needed ballast in it, was a pretty good PR thing for uh, for SpaceX. They probably well, it, it wasn't. It wasn't right. So so for for the geeks and and the overgrown children uh, who like to play video games, it was a really good PR, right? For the uh, folks out marching for. Uh, 15 hours an hour minimum wage, it was like, you know, a slap in the face. And so the problem is, even by doing things like that, we're, we're polarizing. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, what needs to does need to happen is people that that do get $15 an hour in restaurants or whatever need to understand, you know, by having having a robust industry that's in their community, like SpaceX, those employees from SpaceX go to their businesses and help them, you know, keep their employers employed and keep them getting their lower paying non-technical uh, wages coming in. You know, and and I've actually made that argument for, for folks. And of course, most of us here are, you know, we're, we're not the billionaire end, but, but we're most of us making six figures as, as professional folks, right? And, you know, they just kind of roll their eyes and go, you know, you, you don't even get what it's like to, to live on 20,000 a year. You're, you're out. And, and I think, so what's happening is we're, we're not getting people's imaginations anyway, the way uh, Apollo did, right? I mean, all over the world, uh, everybody was glued and cheering, right? And we're, we're not getting that now. And, and we're, we continually have PR that actually for, for the, for both the uh, far liberals and the um, and the lower income folks, uh, just looks like a slap in the face. We're wasting government money for this when I could have something to feed my kids. Yeah, well, so, ask how many of them use a cell phone to navigate. So this is the this is the argument that we shouldn't spend any money on space because there are starving children in Appalachia. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I think there's, but from our end, there's a more fundamental, which which is, uh, if if industry wants to make big profits out of this, they're going to have to take higher risks than than most of them are, and and that's that's something you know. Okay, so NASA doesn't want to do the um, the reusables, so NASA doesn't want to do X, so you know, well, uh, there, well. there's. A lot of, of big dollars in industry, and and maybe they're going to just have to step up and do well, it themselves with, well, maybe, without having maybe, maybe, the checkbook behind them. Yeah, well, I think they're doing that, and maybe the public needs to be more aware. You know, SpaceX almost went broke. Trying now, to, SpaceX is unique, right? You know, well, but, they almost yes. remember they almost went broke around the time of the Grasshopper flight. Oh yes, uh, and it was it was only because Steve Jurvetson funded them to keep them going until they actually had a successful flight. So, you know, if people think that Elon didn't take a risk, they don't get it. Yes, but but if you look at some of the other folks out there, they're, they're the uh, old aerospace fat cats that have made uh, trillions out, out of uh, the aerospace program over the last 60 years. So, so we still don't yeah, have no well those are the people that have been those are the companies that have been getting the cost plus contracts which are precisely absurd absurd i mean you know the fact that 
cost plus was being used for developing like an SLS when we know how to develop rockets. That was almost what I would call an abuse. Waste, yeah. fraud, fraud, waste, or abuse. Oh, exactly. And, and so so that's, that's, the part, that's the part that really <laughs> needs to change is to get away from using cost plus where it doesn't, it, it, it isn't needed. And, and I'm not sure there's anywhere where it's needed anymore. Uh, you can do stuff in, in small segments. You can, you know, uh, sorry, the first one of you past the goal line gets paid. Uh, you know, we'll talk about the yeah. second. Well, me, me That's the way me. a lot of other industries work. And, yeah. and for, yeah, I mean, given where space is coming and, and how, how big uh, the cast of characters company-wise are, you know, uh, maybe we're at the stage where uh, we we no longer uh, give you a safety net. There's an aspect. Yeah, but I, but again, you know, you got to look at what the benefit is of getting it to work. You know, Only did, the government, did the government put much money into uh, into improving aviation? I mean, look at what NACA did for for aviation without without NACA's research on fundamentals of aeronautics and wing shapes and airfoils and stuff, we might not have the aviation industry we have today. Well, and we had a war, which was just throwing dollars at, at anything, aviation, yeah. and, and turned out incredible technologies that and, and lots of trained pilots and all of that, right? And, and hopefully we will not have, uh, we were talking about China, right? Hopefully we won't have to do that with space. I'd just as soon not, but. Yeah. I mean, well, one thing about war is it provides urgency. There's actually, uh, you know, you need it now. You can't, can't wait for it to be delayed 10 years, 20 years. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. There's definitely, with a lot of these government programs, there's a real, um, you know, there's no observed urgency about them. It's like, well, if it gets delayed till next year, well, I guess we'll do it do it then it, it's worse than that it's there are people involved with this that if they can stretch it out as long as they possibly can it's they're incentivized because how they get the there's, there's another, another aspect, aspect to risk that needs to be touched on i was at an isdc a few years ago and uh the panelists were discussing the ask this and the notion is the government needs to write its contracts differently the the business one, the Boeings and the Lockheeds and the launch providers, they, they give the government, they gave the government for 50 years what the government asked for. And uh, uh, one of the panelists was on, on this particular board, uh, was like third in command of Lockheed or something. And he said, yeah, his engineers approached him and said, look, we have this, uh, we've come up with this new idea and uh, we figured out that we can save like $10 million dollars on this $150 million launch. You know, it's a new way to do something, but you know, we've, we've done it small scale in the lab, it works, everything's good. You know, we should ask the customer if they want to do this. And so uh, this number three guy in, in Lockheed uh, went to the general who's uh, a military observation satellite, spy satellite basically was going to be launched on this particular rocket. And he said, hey, how about, you know, would you guys be interested in saving $10 million? And the general listened to the presentation. He says, so you want me to risk a $1 billion spy satellite on this new idea, this rocket, this, this new technique that you guys want to use that will save us $10 million on a launch? And he says, what do you think my answer is? If something goes wrong with that launch, and we lose that satellite, um, you know, it's going to make me look real, real bad. But if I stick with the tried and true method, then if it works, then everybody's happy. And you know what? We'll pay that. We'll skip that $10 million of so-called savings. And so that's really one of the other issues is that this is, you know, the companies, the companies are willing to take the risk. A lot of times the customer was not willing to take the risk. And that was the U.S. military in this case. But I think also, you know, other commercial uh, folks who were launching commercial uh, communication satellites and whatnot. Uh, the, 
the cost benefit ratio to them just did not look appealing. And this had a chilling effect for decades on uh, innovation. We'll just do it the same old way that we've been doing it for the last 30 years. And everyone's happy with that method. And now Elon Musk has come along and he has definitely upset the apple cart. And uh, you know, more power to the guy. And as uh, Dave Chevron was mentioning, yeah, they, they, very, they very nearly went belly up on I think more than one occasion, in fact. So um, yeah, they are taking huge amounts of risk. So uh, you know, to a lesser extent, yeah, I have been, I, I have to agree with you, I am less than impressed with, uh, I, I've been hearing about this Vulcan rocket for like the last seven years. And in the meantime, uh, SpaceX has managed to get a whole lot more done in that same period of time. And I'm thinking uh, Boeing, uh, you know, is Boeing, Boeing is part of that Vulcan uh, launch, I think, or the Vulcan rocket development, is it not? I think it's Blue ULA. Origin. Yeah. ULA, Blue Origin. Okay, well, so, you know, last time I checked, Blue Origin is, is not a traditional rocket supplier. And so they are indeed taking a whole lot of risk. And I mean, so your statement about, oh, well, they need to, you know, get put more risk, you know, or accept more risk, all these companies need to do it. And it's like, you know, them's big words for folks, someone in the oil and gas industry who's getting subsidies, uh, uh, a whole bunches of big subsidies. Okay. And I speak as someone who worked for Schlumberger. So, I mean, you know, there are, if the, if the government wants companies to accept risk, they've got to have some sort of a, some sort the companies have to have some sort of market to be able to sell into once they've taken that risk because the the possibility of failure is very real and very imminent so uh any comments anybody yeah i mean i've i've heard similar stories when one of the guys i used to work with it was uh, yeah, kind of my my mentor when i first started at rockwell international he went into one of the program offices with a way of doing something that would save cost and not introduce any risk. It was just a way of saving cost. And the response was, why would I do that? I would lose people. I would lose budget. I would lose clout. Basically, I'm not going to do that because if I can, if I can continue spending money at the rate I've been spending it, it's better for me because, you know, I'm a bigger manager of a bigger organization with more money. I save it. I lose it. I use, I lose it. You know, there's not, that's, that's the incentive system that results in continuing to try to do things the the way traditionally it's been done for 50 years. And it goes back 50 years uh, and rocket plane Kistler. Oh, I don't know if you remember rocket plane Kistler, but I they do. were, they were, and I I've, I've met Kistler and uh, several of the people that worked with them. And I think they lost about 850 or 870 million on the effort to try to be one of the providers for commercial cargo. I mean, just lost it, 800, almost a billion dollars. So this idea people have that these, these people in the private sector are not taking risk is very ill-conceived. Everybody was pretty concerned that when Bill Nelson took over, when Bill Nelson took over, we were afraid they were going to go back to the old ways of doing everything with cost plus. Because, um, I mean, cost plus contracts, he just ends up wasting an awful lot of money. Um, but he, he surprisingly came out against them recently. So hopefully things will get better. Um, the problem is that we're stuck with a lot of the old cost plus contracts still going on, I think. So that's going to go on for quite a while. But at least in principle, the administrator of NASA says that he thinks they're a bad idea. Now, Congress, they still want to do it. Congress, in a lot of ways, is really the problem. Here. Well, Senator yeah. Shelby has retired, so maybe maybe mm -hmm. some things will yeah. change. Well, it, it's not yeah, it's not just Senator Shelby, though. It's that so many of the Congress, Congress people are there to defend budgets and jobs in their districts. And they've got so many of these, these um, big projects that take a lot of people and you know they want to keep they want to keep the certainty of knowing that the 
traditional big contractor in their district keeps getting keeps getting the funding the way they have been. What would be the way to uh, encourage uh, those same uh, manufacturers, say in uh, Decatur, uh, was it Georgia, Alabama, Decatur, Alabama, to uh, start innovating and really, really coming up with something, say, that's competitive to SpaceX. I, I do have to agree with uh, uh, the lady who was speaking earlier that um, the companies that had so much expertise uh, uh, for the last 50 years, they pretty much, I mean, they, they, they didn't seem to want to innovate. And yet, I mean, and, and true, part of that is the customer saying, we're not interested in innovations. But I mean, I think every company management has the realization that you must continue to innovate your products and develop new products, or you're gonna end up getting left behind. But uh, it's almost as if, you know, NASA and the government wrote their contracts to put a chill, an absolute chill on, on any kind of uh, improvements or, or innovation. So is there a way for the, the end customer to start writing contracts now so that we can remove that uh, roadblock, that, that artificially created roadblock to innovation for all countries, for, for all companies for, in the industry? Uh, I, I don't know enough about contracts to be able to grasp that. The only other uh, example I could give you is here locally in Houston, uh, we were terrified every time there was going to be any kind of major road work uh, on uh, any of the road system around Houston. And it was because of the way that the city of Houston and the Depart Texas Department of Transportation would write the contracts. The contractor would go up. There was one particular contractor who would go out, rip up a road, and then they would not, they would, then they would take their crews away and not do anything further for six months. And then they would show up. And, and this way they got progress payments. They would do as little as possible and keep everything as maximally torn up until like three weeks before the deadline on the contract. And then they would finally come back and finish, finish pouring concrete, okay? And the company said, hey, they did it that way. Williams Brothers did it that way because that was the way the contracts were written. They, they were rewarded for doing their work inefficiently. And when a, a, a city, a, a city of Houston contractor rewrote the contract to give them a, uh, uh, a, an incentive payment for getting the job done. They went, they, they said, okay, we're going to take down that overpass right there at NASA Road 1. And everyone was just having the willies because it was going to take a month. They were going to shut down the Gulf Freeway for a month. And these guys got it done in, they got it done. They started tearing it up on a Friday night and they got it done before Monday morning. And it just goes to show that if you write the contract correctly, then it, things can move real fast. And they got, the company got an incentive payment. Yep, the taxpayers paid an extra 10% from the base cost of the contract. But I mean, it was well worth it. They only, we only had to deal with a shutdown on the, a main artery for uh, two and a half days. So contracts can be rewritten, rewritten. It can be done. And that is the sort of innovation, the sort of paperwork innovation we need in order to start getting hardware and operational innovation, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd like to see right. some, so some we, ways of trying to, yeah, I mean, part of it is just, you know, the company, company culture and all that. I mean, remember, remember the, uh, when, uh, the Swiss watchmaker came up with the court with, with the uh, quartz movement and the Swiss watch company that he worked for said that's not a watch. So he took it to Seiko. Yeah. 